Amen. All right, there we go. All right, I have to I have a confession that my mind went off on this as we were talking about this duo of Paul and Barnabas. I started thinking about some of the other famous duer, duos in history, um, duos like Batman and Robin, Abbott and Costello, or the famous Calvin and Hobbes. I also start uh, me thinking about the famous breakups in history. Um, uh, one of the most devastating breakups for me as a little kid, uh, I mean, elementary age, was when Sonny and Cher broke up because I had such a crush on Cher and I thought, what a, how devastating for her. Um, I, uh, I remember uh, the breakup of Prince Charles, I mean, Princess uh, Diana and Prince Charles, how that effect, uh, went across the world. Um, and then as a young man, of course, there was a breakup of Van Halen and David Lee Roth. You know, breakups really affect us. And of course, I'm just playing around, but but breakups are traumatic in a real sense. When two people have been together for a long time, breakup will, will be devastating. Uh, the uh, tears apart families and organizations, uh, disagreements can cause the downfall of companies and uh, uh, our health. Our, sometimes our health is affected because we are in such sharp disagreement with somebody. And thankfully, right, we're all Christians. We don't, we don't argue. We don't fight, do we? No, that's a lie. We fight. Uh, we Christians, we argue about a lot of things. Uh, fortunately, though, we do have the Holy Spirit and the, who helps us in most cases and through these arguments. I, I really believe that if the church didn't have the Holy Spirit, our fighting and our arguing would be multiplied three, four, four times. I think the Holy Spirit does an amazing work of holding back, holding us back as we rely and we surrender ourselves to him. Uh, today, as we continue marching uh, through Acts and seeing how the church is growing. Today, we come to an especially sad portion of Scripture. And honestly, as I was studying this portion of Scripture, I was actively looking for ways to, to soften it or to, to water it down. I, you know, looking at the original language, it can't be that bad. And, and everywhere I looked, yes, it, it was. These two pillars of the church, Barnabas, the... Um, the, the encourager, the one who, who, who brought Paul in, the one who brought so much money to the, to the apostles and started a, uh, an outflowing of, of love uh, through giving. And Paul, this man who had a personal experience with the risen Lord Jesus Christ, both of them apostles in their own right. One, I mean, they're the dynamic duo of Christianity, right? Of the early church. Yet our pastors today, we, we come to a place where their argument between each other gets so bad that they cannot continue. They split. They break up. And we wish stuff like this wasn't in the Bible, but it is. And isn't that, that's actually one reason I think that uh, it, it kind of shows us how real and how true Scripture is. Because if, if Scripture is written by some man trying to build up a religion, he would not have stuff like this in there. Yet our passage today uh, is about this, this sharp conflict between two pillars of the church. Um, so before we read our passage, though, I want to review the relationship. I want to go through, and I, I'm hoping that, that this will mean, help you understand how tight, how strong the relationship with. Sometimes we just read and we don't realize the depth that's there. And I'm going to leave this up as I do, so that as I've mentioned different places, you can see how much these guys traveled 
together. By all accounts, Barnabas was saved at the preaching of Peter at Pentecost. And according to Acts 4, his name was originally Joseph, and uh, he was a Levite born on the island of Cyprus, the island out in the middle of, of the Mediterranean there off the coast. Uh, he, he was a man of some financial means because it says that he sold his land and gave the money to the church. And so Barnabas becomes an early pillar in the church. And then enter this man who is known for persecuting the church, for dragging Christians from their homes. Saul, he has, he's had an encounter with Jesus Christ, but nobody trusts him. None of the apostles will, will uh, give him time. The Christians avoid him, thinking that this is just a ploy to, um, to get in the church, and so he can persecute and drag more people off. Barnabas, though, gives him a chance. Barnabas goes to see him because that's Barnabas's heart. His heart is people. And Barnabas goes to see Paul, and he spends time with Paul, and he, he discerns that Paul is for real. And he brings, uh, brings Paul to the apostles and introduces them in. Well, sometime uh, Paul, Saul leaves, goes on like kind of a, a learning, training, growing sabbatical, and Barnabas continues. Now, I wonder if this incident of Paul, I mean, of Barnabas introducing uh, Paul into the church was the reason why when in Antioch, they needed someone to go discern what's going on in Antioch, the church growing in Antioch. I wonder if that's why they sent Barnabas, because he had already proven himself to have, be a man of some discernment. And that's where uh, we pick up the relationship. Barnabas is sent up to Antioch to check out this new act of the Holy Spirit growing this church uh, in the Gentile world. And he encourages the, 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 the people, it grow, the church grows, and he needs help. He, under, he realizes whether he, it's too much for him to handle, or he thinks of Paul, and he says, I have just the person who, who would be perfect for this place. Paul, anyway, what he does, he just leaves Antioch. And if you look at look where Antioch is, that, uh, that circle up there in um, up here by Syria, Paul had to, I mean, Barnabas had to go all the way up around here to Tarsus to get Paul. So it wasn't Saul. So it wasn't a short trip. So he was gone for, I would say, weeks to, to find Saul, grab him, and bring him back. And this starts this relationship uh, where they are not separated again until many years later in our passage here. So they start ministering together in Antioch, and by all accounts, I mean, by all accounts, I say but some, some uh, uh, commentators, they refer to Barnabas as the pastor of the church in Antioch, and Paul is kind of his helper and assistant. Well, we see that uh, in the church of Antioch, you have several prophets, and Barnabas and Paul are both listed there as the prophets who are in, in Antioch. And out of these prophets, um, two, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, a, prof, um, a prophet named Agabus shows up, and he, he talks about this great famine that's going to happen. And so the church, the elders of the church of Antioch, choose both Paul and and uh, Saul and Barnabas. See, the, the elders already saw those two as a team, and they worked together. So right off the bat, they click as partners. We all, we all have people like that where we just kind of click with them, and it just works. That's, that's the way Paul and Barnabas were, or Saul and Barnabas were. They just kind of clicked. And so if you notice, okay, so, so anyway, the church of Antioch, they collect uh, money for the churches in Judea because uh, Agabus talks about this famine that's coming to Judea. And so if you notice the, the thin little arrow, uh, Paul and Barnabas take this trek together down to Jerusalem and Judea 
to present the money, but also to give report about the church in Antioch. They return with them, returns this young guy named John Mark, who is Barnabas's younger cousin. And as they return, they continue the ministry in Antioch, and then the Holy Spirit calls out Paul and Barnabas, the dynamic duo, to go on a mission trip. The elders send him send them out, and Barnabas, who is now who is the leader of the this trip, because he's list it's listed as Barnabas and Saul. Uh, decides to take John Mark. And we don't know if, if Saul was happy about this or if, if this was something that stuck in his craw that, that uh, Barnabas was bringing uh, John Mark. We don't know. But what we do know is that everything was going well as they moved across the island of Cyprus. And I'm sure John Mark was like, cool, this is awesome, seeing people um, respond to the gospel uh, here people are listening to Barnabas and Paul as they speak, and probably Barnabas took the lead at this point, um, until they hit the, uh, the city of Paphos, where um, the proconsul Sergius Paulus wanted to see them. And standing in their way was one magician who was trying to keep Paul and Barnabas away from the proconsul Sergius Paulus. Elymas that was a false prophet and a magician. He was opposing them. And Saul, this is where Saul had had enough. And he, he cursed, he says he looked him straight in the eyes and he said, you son of the devil. And he says some other things. You are going to be blind for a time. And bang. God struck him blind immediately, and the proconsul then uh, is converted and becomes a Christian. They leave Cyprus together, now Paul and Barnabas together, but now it's not Paul, uh, Barnabas and Saul. Now it's Paul and his company leave Cyprus. They go to Pamphylia, and that's where John Mark says, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. Whether it's because well, it's probably because he was still a young Christian, and he was all out for the adventure, but when it became difficult, he 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 missed. It was difficult for him, and I don't know if you know. Now all of a sudden, Paul, because Paul is more of the driver type of personality. If Paul wasn't as forgiving of John Mark's mistakes in his youth. Um, uh, or what it was, but John Mark leaves, and he runs home uh, to, to Jerusalem. Now, then Paul and Barnabas, the dynamic duo, experience, you can see it there, they experience opposition from the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people in Antioch. They, they, are, they, are flee, they flee Iconium uh, to avoid being killed. Uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, then are stoned, and Paul is, I mean, called gods. And then not too long after that being called gods, they're being stoned, and Paul is actually left for dead. And then he gets up and he returns back to the city. Uh, and so suffice to say, Paul and Barnabas on that first missionary trip grew a lot together as a team, as friends, um, and they return to Antioch, and they report together what's going on. And there was great rejoicing. They loved it, right? So upon returning to Antioch, they don't get to rest very long because now there's a group from Jerusalem who are, they're in Antioch and they're saying that, okay, you, you Gentiles, now that you're saved, you must be circumcised. And both Paul and Barnabas, it says, stood toe to toe with these guys. And the argument became so sharp that the elders in the church of Antioch said, guys, you need to take this to Jerusalem, and you need to talk to the, the church down there and the apostles and deal with this because this is, is a problem. And so both Barnabas and Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas, head to Jerusalem. And we just got done talking about the Jerusalem Council. I find it very interesting, though, and I think this plays into 
the whole dynamic, that when they were at the Jerusalem Council, it says that Peter spoke, it said that James spoke, but then it said that Barnabas and Paul spoke, not Paul and Barnabas, but Barnabas was listed first. Still, Barnabas is seen as the elder statesman in this relationship. He's the one that they'll listen to in Jerusalem because he's a known quantity. They've had experience with him. And then what's interesting is now when they turn back and go back to Antioch with this letter uh, and with uh, Judas and Silas, it then uh, Luke reverts back to calling the team Paul and Barnabas. So as soon as they leave, leave Jerusalem, go back to Antioch, now it's Paul and Barnabas. So there's definitely a dichotomy between the Jewish believers and how they see this team and the non-Jewish uh, Gentile believers, how they see this team. This is two trips now that they've taken together from Antioch down to Judea and back, and then down to Judea and back. And then they've taken this long trip with many dangers and many sorrows and many hurts together. So now this is the team we're looking at. Uh, the, they're a true dynamic duo. They've, they've been through such hardship together. They've traveled a lot of miles together. They've weathered a lot of hardships together, and they've overcome a lot of opposition together. The, like I said, they're the real dynamic duo. Batman and Robin have nothing over these two. Now we're caught up to where we are now um, in, in Acts 15. And before I continue, let, before we read this passage, let me pray. So please pray with me. Father God, we pray that you would speak through your word this morning, that you would take this difficult passage of these two pillars, these two heroes of the faith, and see, when we see them fight to such a point where they cannot continue together, I pray that you would make this instructive to us, that we would be able to grow from this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's, let's read. Uh, the passage. Read with me as, as I go, and it says, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers and sisters in every city in which we proclaim the word of God, or the word of the Lord, and see how they are. And Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also, but Paul was of the opinion that they should not take along with them this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them. Paul needs to get on the road again. That's the kind of person Paul is. He needs to get out there doing the work. He, he's wired for adventure and danger. He's wired to, to build the church. Christ has got him uh, and gifted him with this pioneering go get him uh, spirit. Verse 37, we see that Barnabas has a more caring and discipling heart. God has wired Barnabas differently. He wants to further John Mark's maturing process. He wants to give John Mark a second chance. In fact, we see Barnabas is all about second chances. He's the one that brought Paul in, right? He gave Paul a chance, and he wants to give John Mark a chance here to prove himself. He's been with John Mark this whole time, and I'm sure... When Mary originally said, John Mark, you go with your bigger brother, your bigger cousin Barnabas, I'm sure she said, Barnabas, could you please help him to get in the ministry? Help my boy become a pastor. Help my boy become like you, a man of God. And so he took it and he's mature, discipling the John Mark up. And he so he spent all this time discipling John Mark. He knows John Mark is ready for the heavy lifting now. And Paul will have nothing to do with it. In fact, the reasoning Paul uses to take to not to take John Mark with them is the very reason Barnabas wants to take him. Um, now, this is just conjecture, but we have to, to, to read into the story a bit. Uh, I see that um, Bar, uh, Paul was of the opinion that we shouldn't take him because he deserted us. He left us. 
And Barnabas is like, yeah, I know he left us. We need to give him another chance. He needs, he, he can, he can be a, a very, uh, he could be an asset to our team. Which is great until we hit this next verse. Continuing verse 39. Now, it turned into such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas, one of those who came back from Jerusalem, uh, with them to present the paper to to uh, the letter to Antioch about you know about uh, salvation through grace alone, uh, faith alone. Um, but Paul chose Silas and left and after being entrusted by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he, uh, he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, this is the start of Paul's awesome second missionary journey. On this missionary journey, so much happens that we can read about in scripture in the in the he writes letters a lot of our scripture comes out of of Paul's writings comes out of the second and third missionary journey and it's there's no doubt that God has uses Paul in these journeys but it's sad that it started like this it started with a disagreement and a fight a fight that was irreconcilable in verse 39, this is one of those verses that you wish was not in the story. And as I was studying, like I said, I kept searching for ways to try to soften this fight, but it isn't in there. The original Greek, I'm looking at the Greek and, and commentaries, and everyone just said what it means is that the, the argument, the, the, the disagreement became so sharp. Some even say it became so personal that they could not continue together, that it was an ongoing disagreement. I wish they were mature enough at this point to say, okay, we understand, you know, and perhaps, I mean, perhaps they didn't add this in Scripture, but perhaps, um, perhaps they did. Perhaps they were mature enough to say, listen, we're not going to agree with this. So why don't we double our efforts? And why don't we just go our separate ways? Again, the Greek does not give way for that. The Greek just says, talks about this sharp disagreement. And it talks about the raise, the elevation of, of emotions. So here we have this. And there's, uh, like I said, a, a sense of emotion in this. So it means that this was not just a one-time get together, talk about it, argue about it, come back and reconcile. Every time they talked about going out, they had this argument. So these two pillars of the church, the dynamic duo, break because of one young man, John Mark, and it wasn't even his fault. It was it was the, the differing views. Of him, he was kind of a pawn. That was was an excuse. Um, so, in fact, this uh, this separation that we see, this difficulty, ends up for the good of the gospel. And we know that God works everything out for the good of those who love God. And and we don't doubt that both Barnabas and Paul, and John Mark loved God and served God. In fact, it, um, looking at this episode from two different perspectives, we can kind of get some bigger picture approach. And let me, let me look at this really quick. Um, so there's two ways to look at this uh, from a literary point of view and, and also from a practical literary meaning in the writing. I believe the Holy Spirit so guided the writing of scripture, that he not only guided it in the fact of putting the truth down, 
but he also guided it into how to put the truth down and what stories to add in that would would uh, contribute to the long plot of God's literary story that he was writing for us to learn and grow by. And so a couple of things to keep in mind that this is Luke's historical account of what's happening by the by the uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Luke is writing to Theophilus, and what he's doing, he's he remember he was a companion of, of Paul. He was Paul's personal doctor. And he sees throughout uh, Paul's ministry people doubting Paul's apostleship and challenging his authority because he was not with Jesus when Jesus walked on this earth. He was a latecomer. He was a Johnny come lately. People didn't, there were a lot of the Judaizers who, who were bad, would bad mouth uh, with uh, Paul. And so Luke writes this historical account and he gradually moves from uh, to, to validate this gospel that Paul is presenting and even to validate Paul himself. In this split, we see Paul being ever more set aside, individualized, pulled out as a leader. See, when he was with, with Barnabas, in the eyes of Jerusalem, he was under the tutelage of Barnabas. Now, because of the split in this story, Paul is now a leader in his own right. He is now separated out for the gospel, and we can see, we know by reading all the different books that he letters that he wrote, this truly worked for the good of of the the story the, and the good of scripture. Now, if we take a practical look, we see that this ministry just multiplied. You just had you had one team going out, and now all of a sudden you have two teams going out. You had two men, Paul and Barnabas, involved with this ministry. Now all of a sudden there's five men, Paul and Silas. And Paul, interestingly enough, picks up his own disciple on his first stop on his this this tour that this this missionary journey he's going. So now you have Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and then you got Barnabas and John Mark, his disciple, going out, and they're going two different ways. So before it was just one direction. Now you got a split divergence of two groups of churches being ministered to by these men of God, and that I think is is a huge silver lining on all of this. That if these two men of God did not allow their own personal conflict to interrupt their ministry of the gospel. They continued pursuing the Lord. Um, from this study, I picked up a couple of uh, principles when dealing with disagreement that I think helps us to understand um, because we have all seen Christians fight. Christians fight over carpet. Christians fight over the singing. We fight over um, tongues. We fight over the gifts. We fight over women in ministry. We fight over what clothing you can wear to, to, to church. And we, we argue about things, and we all have our own strong opinions about these things. And so what happens when you disagree? Well, first of all, we need to realize that we do fight. We don't agree on everything. And sometimes we can be very obstinate. And being obstinate just kind of shows our immaturity. Yes, Paul and Barnabas in their obstinacy, in their fighting, kind of showed their immaturity. And, and, and they, they both had growing to do. We also know that personalities play a huge central part in most of our serious disagreements. Paul and Barnabas were definitely two very different personalities. Paul was a type A driver who organized and just went. Barnabas was a, uh, I don't even know what type 
personality it is, but he's, he was a people person. He was a person who, who invested in individuals and he, he could feel the emotions from people and minister to that. Some people are gifted like that. And it's an amazing gifting to be able to just speak directly to people's hearts. We're not all gifted like that. We're all not all gifted to be able to be as organized and, 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 and focused. I always tell my fifth grade students when, you know, they're fighting, this always comes into play because when they're arguing about something or he did this, blah, blah, blah. I always talk to them about there's two types of students in this class. There are those students who are more emotional, more, more personable. You love uh, people. You love doing stuff with people. Then you got uh, other people who just want to do. They want to go out and play soccer. They want to accomplish something. And they, they focus on getting things done. And you know what? Those students who are focused on getting things done, sometimes you end up hurting the people who are more emotional and more uh, more relational, and you don't even realize it. And you who are more relational, sometimes you get hurt for the dumbest reasons. You walk into a room, all of a sudden the conversation stops, and your first thought is, they were talking about me. Why don't they like me? What did I do wrong? And so on both sides, we need to try to understand the other perspective. That's key. That's very important that we under, try to understand each other's perspective. Sometimes, though, as we see in Scripture, separation for a time is the wisest move, but always with an eye towards reconciliation. Always with an eye towards reconciliation. Um, Paul and Barnabas separated. And perhaps stepping away is what's necessary sometimes. But understanding that this separation isn't a permanent solution. This is a time for you to get with God, get a new perspective, mature a bit, uh, learn through Scripture and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit what you did wrong, because none of us are 100% right in our stances, so our commitment is towards reconciliation. And Paul was a person who needed, he was a person just like you and me, and he needed to grow and he needed to learn. Uh, he needed to mature. We all need that. It's interesting to note that this Paul, who had this fight with Barnabas and separated out, also wrote more about unity in scripture than anyone else. Ephesians 4.3, Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. That was the apostle Paul. Romans 12.10 says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Romans 12.16 says, live in harmony with one another. In Romans 12.18, he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. And I believe that, well, I believe, I, as I was reading more scripture and reading Paul, I could see how this event spoke into a lot of the things that Paul wrote. If it is possible, he might have had in his mind this event in his life. The reality that, yeah, I need to leave and leave space for people who really struggle in this area. But the point is always to come together. So both Paul and John Mark had to mature. You know, sometimes we have to break. Sometimes we have to go through really difficult times in order for God to tear us down to the point where we're willing to grow and learn. And when I was in, in boot camp, that's what they did. You know, they spent half the boot camp tearing you down, making you, you feel awful. And then the other half building you up into the kind of men and women that they want you to be that could serve in the military. So what about Paul and Barnabas? Did they ever reconcile? 
There's nothing in scripture actually that says that they came together, had a great hug fest. They didn't, they didn't spend a special time of a reconciliation time of reconciliation uh, with candlelights or all that that I've seen. It, it wasn't like that. But 10 years later, Paul does write. In 1 Corinthians 9, 6, that Barnabas is a fellow apostle, and he's a fellow worker for the cause of Christ. So we do see that there's no ill that continued. And I would imagine, because, you know, Paul and Barnabas, they were pillars of the church. They were uh, mature in their own sense. And, they, of course, they had to do some more growing. But we as Christians also when we get in a fight with someone or, or an argument that just can't be reconciled, we got to understand it, it, the issue is the issue, not the person. The issue is the issue and not the person. We need to keep that relationship and just deal with that issue. It's, uh, it's called um, having a clean argument. Have a clean argument. Don't let person, your personalities, don't let your emotions, your hurts get into this discussion. Keep your discussion on another level, on a, another plane. And I kind of think that's where Paul and Barnabas were. I hope, and I lean on the fact that Paul and Barnabas were mature enough to say, Okay, we cannot agree with this. We need to go minister our separate ways. And they didn't hold any personal ill towards each other. They just knew they didn't agree in this one situation. To the point where they had to separate. Okay, we also know that God uses everything. Even our arguments to advance his agenda. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that all things, even sharp disagreements, it doesn't say that, but I added that, sharp disagreements, all of this works together for the good of those who love God. Now, this doesn't justify our bitterness and our, our fights, but it does give us some solace to understand that the wrath of men can be turned into the praise, praise for God. So God can take everything we do and turn it into praise. If he, can, if he can take rocks and have them praise him, then he can take our, our sin and turn it into good for him. I can see here another time when, when Paul might have been reflecting on this episode with, with Paul, when he says, God works together, I mean, sorry, uh, we all won't lose my words here. God works together for good for those who love God. And I think Paul could, might have even been reflecting on this event. This can't be a minor event in his memory. It's got to be a major event in his memory. Because his great friend, Barnabas, they separated. They couldn't, they weren't together anymore. We got to understand God's in control. He's using everything. And sometimes we need to back off, like I said, and separate. And it could be actually sometimes we make things worse by trying to fix it. Sometimes we just need to back off and understand that we don't see the big picture. We don't see what God is doing in our lives. You know, maybe God is breaking us for the very purpose that he has a special ministry for us to work. Next one is it's okay to hold to strong convictions. It's okay to hold to strong convictions, but you need to hold to even stronger the understanding that you may not be 100% right in your conviction. And your person that you're talking to may have even a kernel of truth that you're not seeing. So it's important that, if, that we don't dig ourselves in where we don't see the big picture. We don't know 100% what God is doing, we can't rely on, uh, let me say this, we can't, and this, is, this happens a lot in the church, people go out, they listen to sermons, they learn something from sermons, and then they stand on that conviction 
that they learned from the sermon. But the guy was such a good preacher. He was such a good Bible teacher. Instead of going back to Scripture themselves and developing their own convictions, who knows if that guy, that preacher, didn't get something wrong in his study of Scripture? Who knows if he didn't get some of his own self into his message, and now you're holding that as a conviction? You guys, we, I say you, but we need to get ourselves into the Word, into Scripture for our convictions. We can't let our personal uh, peeves or someone else's personal peeves drive our, our convictions. Um, lastly, in everything, we need to have love and grace. And I, I, I've heard of this saying before, never knew it was from this German Lutheran theologian, Rupertus uh, Meldenius, I guess. He said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. And that charity is the same word that we use for love. So, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love. And I, the last thing I'd like to leave you with is this scripture here. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. And look at this last piece. It's very interesting because we think of he's going to disclose the purposes of our heart. We think of bad, but that's not what Paul is saying here. Then each one of you will receive his commendation from God. See, we all fail. But as Christians, we don't, our purposes, our heart is not to fail, is not to sin, is not to cause arguments. Our heart, our purposes, is for peace, for unity, for uh, relationship, for uh, praising and magnifying our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the end times, that is what's going to come out and shine. God's going to pull that out and say, your purposes were to glorify me, and that's what counts. See, we can't judge others. We can't judge others' purposes by, by their actions, because sometimes we mess up. What we need to do is understand that as Christians, we know for a fact that every single person who's a born-again Christian has the Holy Spirit. And every single person who has the Holy Spirit, the purposes of their heart is to glorify God. And if it's not, then you don't have the Holy Spirit, and you need to know about Jesus Christ in a deeper way. So our default is to glorify God as a Christian. That, that is our default. And that is, as we relate with other Christians, we got to understand that even though I fight with you, I need to understand your heart is to glorify God. My heart is to glorify God. And that will, will, will keep us united together in Christ. Join me. Father God, I do thank you for your love and your, your clarity in situations. Help us to see each other, other Christians, as your children, as your children who want to glorify you. Regardless of how we interact on the physical, emotional level, I pray that our minds would always have, be respectful of each other, that we would maintain the unity that your Spirit has given us already, and to glorify you. And as I close, uh, let me just say one more thing. It is interesting to see that Paul when he's in jail and he knows he's going to be executed and killed 
any time now, he calls for John Mark to come and minister to him because John Mark is useful in the ministry. So it's, it's neat how that comes around like that. And again, the Holy Spirit weaving this story to glorify God. Thank you.